pas les temps, hein, on pas que les mots sur la terre. A lovely lady did my eye makeup and she said, Megan, you're not to cry. <laughs> so I'm not going to cry. I'm going to try not to cry. Oh, it's just so lovely to see you all. Um, so thank you for coming. That's the first thing. It's not my thing. Um, and yeah, I want to thank my aunt. She's come from London. I can't see her. Yeah. Oh, there she is. She's come from London. I think I'm her friend here from Donegal, but I don't know if she's here yet. She may not have made it yet. Um, and then the people who've trekked from the south side. <laughs> yeah, that's a big event, I know. <laughs> and everyone who's come from around here too. You know, you give up your Sunday afternoon and I really appreciate it. I really, really do. Thank you. Um, yeah, so before I got here, I had a lot of rejections. I know people say, oh, J.K. Rowling had 16 rejections. And I go, yeah, well, I had about 150. <laughs> um, I really did. And like, I got to know rejections like you know cold. <laughs> um, you, you, you know, when you get a cold, you, well, for me, I get a tickle in the throat. And I go, OK, I know what's going to happen next. So it's going to sore throat, and I'm going to have a runny nose, and it runs for about a week. And with the rejection, it's kind of I know the pattern. I get it, and I go, oh, it's fine, the first day. And then the next day, it begins to kick in. And then about four or five days, I'm giving up. I'm never going to write again. And then about seven days, I kind of go, oh, well, you know what? I've got to write because that's what makes me happy. So I'm back to the writing thing. Um, so it's very unusual not to get a rejection for this to have happened. I went into town yesterday and thought, I'm going to go into Eason's. I'm going to see if it's there. And it was. It was in the children's department. And it was faced out. It was inside. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it's funny because I was only looking on the sides. I didn't bother to look. And I went, oh, I couldn't start it. I had to go home and lie down for an hour. Because <laughs> I, I couldn't go to Hodges Figures. I couldn't go to Dubray Book. I couldn't take it. Um, so anyway, it has been a long road. That's the rejection one. Um, and then just beginning to write, um, like when I was very small, I loved stories and uh, I love fairy tales. And my godmother gave me the Hans Christian Andersen big book of tales. I'm so grateful to her. Before I was six, which was very young, a massive book. Um, and I remember thinking that fairy tales were real. Um, you know, like, this is real. Is it? Yes, I think it is. Um, <laughs> And then when I found out they weren't real, I saw the real Queen of England. I thought she should have a puppy dress and a crown, but no, she was in her little twin suit. I said, oh no. Um, and you know, the world became a little bit kind of 2D for me. It wasn't so interesting. Um, and then I was writing my stories in school and the, the teacher said, you read too much Ian of Leiden. Um, and that really hurt me. I was like, oh. Um, so uh, when I was in secondary school, I was just writing, you know, boring essays like on the environment and things like that. Um, and then I went through college, and it was only much later I started to write. And I remember coming up here to Argyll into the tea room, and I started to frenzily write something. I was going, "What's coming out of my hand? This is unbelievable!" And I was writing full scat pages. I was sweating, and my heart was going like this. And then I got into my car, and I put the pages on the roof of my car. And I remember, I, you know the way, you, well, I don't know if you do that, but I've done this before. I forgot. Got into the car, drove down the hill to the sea road along by Balbriggan, and looked in my rear w window, or no, mirror, and all I could see were pages. They were, that, it was my first novel. <laughs> huh? So I parked the car, I was running around the road, getting all these pages covered in mud. Um, and then I thought, oh, you know, I'm writing a book, so what do you need in the book? Oh, yeah, you need a love interest. So I put this love, you know, Robert Redford type, you know, I ruined the whole thing. Because I suppose once I think about trying to get published, then I forget it. It doesn't work. I can't focus on that. I can only focus on the story. Um, so yeah, I learned that there. Um, so anyway, I wrote three adult novels before I got here. Um, two literary agents, couldn't sell them for various reasons. My first, um, Protagonist, she was too whiny, according to the poli not the politicians, the publishers. Um, my second novel, I killed off the main character too early. Um, I kind of lost confidence. She was in her 90s in a nursing home and she couldn't move and she couldn't speak. You know, it was difficult. <laughs> 
And then my third novel, which I thought was going to be my masterpiece, I really worked hard on that, about an Afghan family moving to Ireland. I got to meet an editor, and she said, yeah, but just cut out the whole Muslim Afghan thing and just make a love story and make the main character, the male guy, everyone wants somebody, you know, everyone's going to fall in love with. And I just couldn't do it. And I was heartbroken. And then what happened was, um, somebody heard me speaking at a library event and she said, you'd be really good at teaching creative writing to children. And I was going, oh, I don't know. I'm a tr I am a qualified teacher. Anyway, so she said, yes, we need somebody. And, um, that somebody was a girl called Beth, um, and her sister Emma, and her parents are here, and they're very important, you shall find out why. They're hugely important for this novel, and I'm sure in their own lives too. <laughs> but for my novel, these people are very, very important. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, I started to uh, teach Beth, and we did lovely things. We used to go to the Marion Hotel, and she'd write a story maybe about a Christmas tree, or we'd go to the Hugh Lane Gallery and she'd write about a painting and I had a ball, I think she did too. She used to actually ask for a class with me from Santa Claus for Christmas. <laughs> That's the greatest compliment I ever got, it really was. Um, anyway, one year I said to Beth, what's your address because I want to send you a Christmas card. And she told me the address, which was number three Hawthorne Road. <laughs> well, we've changed it slightly, but it was. And I went, That's the house my father grew up in. That's the exact house in the whole of Dublin that my dad grew up. And I rang dad, I said, is that right? He said, yeah, that's right. Um, and I told Beth, and she told her mum, who is here today, Sarah Chamberlain and her husband, Brian O'Brien, and they invited me over for afternoon tea. And I went to that house, this old red brick house in Clonsky, and uh, I remember sitting out that, outside that house when I maybe was four or five when my grandparents lived there. I don't remember being in it. I do remember being outside it. And anyway, in we went, and they built on an extension to the back of the house. And I was sitting there, and I was thinking, what if when they built the extension, they caused some sort of cracks in the walls of the house? And those cracks allowed Beth, my student, to time travel back to when my dad lived there with his brother, Robin, who was a tearaway, and his sister, Beryl, um, and my lovely grandparents. And I always knew my uncle Robin would be a really good character in the novel because he was a fabulous character in life. And his stories were shocking. And I only know about, I'd say, 1% of them. His daughter <laughs> is here, I'm looking at her, um, Suella. Um, so I thought, gosh, this could make a really good book. you know. And then what if he came into now? And then what if the two families got stuck in the house together in the same time zone? So I got very excited. And I also thought, I'm forgetting about this publishing mark because it just doesn't work. I'm just going to write this book for fun. And I wanted to write it for my dad. And I hoped he would read it. And he did read it. And he really liked it. So that was enough for me, actually. I was very happy. I think I might have sent it to a couple of agents and publishers, but you know, I really didn't expect anything of it, and I forgot all about it. Um, and then six years later, six years later, I was still writing short stories and then another novel. Um, Una Roycroft, who works with me, and she's here somewhere, anyway, I can't see her, but um, she told me she was pitching a novel to the O'Brien Press for Culture Night. They, had in, they said to people, if you write 50 words and send it in to us, if we like the 50 words, you can come in and pitch your novel for 10 minutes. Um, and I thought, she, she said, will you help me with my pitch? And I said, yeah, and I thought, sure, I may as well give it a go. So in I went, and I got all dressed up because it was Friday night and sat down and told them about the novel, the teenage novel I was writing, and they said, yes, we want to see it, and they were very positive, and I was very surprised, and I went, okay. And then they said, mm, it's not quite ready, they said, at Christmas, have you written anything else? And I told them all about my adult novels, and their eyes were kind of glazing over, and then I told them about <laughs> this magical house, this old house, and the time travel, and I went, oh yeah, yeah, that sounds good, send it in. So I sent that in at Christmas, and then in the March, I got the phone call that all writers dream of, really do. And it's funny, because I always am thinking, when am I going to get it, and when will I get the email? And it's never what you expect. And um, I thought it was the VHI with the, you know, a renewal. 
And I saw the Dublin number and I didn't even ring it back. Like, and, uh, and I had a few minutes before class one afternoon and I thought, sure, I'll ring them back. And it was, you know, Kunik O'Brien from the O'Brien Press, can you ring me back, please? <gasps> so I said to all the children, hey, sit down, sit down. And then I rang her back. And uh, she said, yeah, we all love your book. And I kept it under wraps like, during class because I would have just had a complete meltdown. So that was fantastic. Anyway, in order to get here, there are some people I want to thank. Um, and I'm so happy that you're all here in the room. It's just wonderful. So first of all, to my mum and dad, um, who brought me to the library every Saturday, um, which was the most wonderful gift. I think I read the book several times in Stavorgan Library. Um, also, they gave me my education. I went to college for six years. Or, you know, I did one thing and then oh, I did another thing and then I did another thing. And all useful, all have paid off. Um, Dad used to tell us stories at lunchtime, I think on Sundays, back in Tanuni. Um, so stories were big in our house and books and language and Mum's always looking up the dictionary for various words. Um, and mum edited my essays through college and I was never and I still am not a great speller so I thought I couldn't be a writer but you can be a writer you don't have to be a brilliant speller so that's wonderful particularly now with the little red wiggly line on your computer <laughs> so it's fantastic and then in my creative writing school mum gave me so many books on writing so I've got just a, shelves of books on writing I can't see where mum is right now Oh, there she is, there she is. Thanks, Mum. Yeah, so those two have made this possible. I'm so grateful. Um, and then my husband, oh, <laughs> and my husband, Oshin, um, he, he was the first reader of my fiction work. And I remember I'd written my first novel and I had shown nobody and I just said to Oshin, will you read a little bit of this? And he was sitting on the sofa, and I had my head stuck into the corner of the sofa and my bum in the air. I was just cringing and dying. Oh, God, he's reading it. Oh, what's he going to think? And he said the best thing he could have said. He said, Megan, you're a writer. Oh, I mean, you know, that was just wonderful. Um, and then he gave me laptops to write on. He gave me a beautiful pen to sign today. And on it is engraved... And one day, the girl with the books became the woman who wrote them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, she has a, a saying, he goes, a happy wife means a happy life. <laughs> <laughs> and he certainly makes me very happy. So thank you to Oshin. And then on to my siblings and my friends. Um, who, I think the main thing is the listening, actually, who have listened to me, um, who have read my work, read early drafts, um, and because, you know, I think I probably wasn't that much fun to be around quite a lot of the time because I was quite depressed. <laughs> you know, like, oh, I've got another rejection. It was hard, you know, but to have people who listened was just, and who encouraged me, you know, um, so valuable, just somebody to listen. So I just want to thank you very, very much for that. And yeah, thank you. Um, and then more people to thank, Sarah and of course, Chamberlain and Beth and Brian O'Brien for asking me for that afternoon tea. You see why they're so important. That's why if they hadn't, if she hadn't asked me for afternoon tea, I wouldn't be here. Oh, Beth, if Beth hadn't asked me, Beth, unfortunately, is, well, not unfortunately, fortunately for Beth, she's cooking down in Ballymaloo, and she's doing her dream. So we're both doing our dream, yeah. Um, and she, the main character, Beth, is, is called after Beth in the book. Um, I want to thank the O'Brien Press, obviously, for publishing my book, for providing the tea and coffee and the hot chocolate out there. I hope you're getting hot chocolate and cookies, people. On to the cookies. Christine, my neighbour. Oh, God, if you could all have a neighbour like her, you'd be very lucky. She appears like an angel whenever I'm feeling blue with a bag of something delicious. Quite incredible. She has some sort of antennae. Um, and when I, I just thought, oh, Christine's cookies off my lunch, will you please? And she did. I don't know how many hours she's been cooking, but she's made... <laughs> She's made 239 cookies. <laughs> 
And I was testing them. She said, I'm her food tester. That was what I wanted to be when I was small, a food tester. And then I won. And she said, uh, and she said um, test these. I had five in a row straight. They should come with a warning, as she said. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and thank you to Tom O'Reilly from our Gildan Castle, who's here, I'm sure, somewhere as well, um, for giving us this beautiful place, which is so perfect for this book. You know, an old house. And are there any cracks in the walls? I can't see, but you know, I'm sure there are somewhere. Um, and for the Historical Society of Scaries gave me this mic. Thank you. And Una Roycroft asked them for it. So thank you. Um, Paddy from the Scaries Bookshop, who's out there, I hope selling books. <laughs> that's his job. Um, and Paddy um, was the person who, that's where I started my creative writing classes, upstairs in the Scaries Bookshop, around my friend's kitchen table, my mum's chairs from the kitchen, and three or four students. And actually, I hope one of my very first students is here, Barbara Coleman. I don't see her, but... I did hear she was coming, but anyway, so it's just wonderful. And lots of my students, past and present, are here, which is so nice. I really, it's just lovely to see you. Um, and to Sharon, running outside, who's, she said to me about 10 days ago, Megan, there's one thing I could do to help. <laughs> this please, Sharon, could you just coordinate this, please? And she did, and she makes things look beautiful, and she makes herself look beautiful. So I'm so grateful to Sharon. She enabled me to sleep. Um, and Terry, who's out there helping her too, um, also she was there that day, and her daughter Aoife, and Hannah Rudden, who is a past student of mine, who is now working with me, assisted on summer camps, and is out pouring the Prosecco, um, hopefully with a heavy hand, so I <laughs> um, Yeah, so that's all my speech, and now what I'm going to do is just read the first opening pages of the book. And I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you're not too hot, because I know it is a little bit warm in here. And um, so, yes, here we go. That's the rule of my love, I'm afraid. I think we should get in contact with her, unless she's a WPJ. No, it's good. <laughs> but then here we go. Beth stood on the doorway of her new home, dolefully sniffing the salty air. She didn't want to be in Dublin. She wanted to be at home in London with her best friend Aisha. But since her grandmother died, the whole family had moved from England across a grey, windy sea to Ireland. It had all come as such a shock. One day her gran was ill in hospital, and the next she was dead. Nobody warned Beth it was going to happen. But afterwards, they talked as if they had expected it all along. Oh, she was very sick, they murmured. Only a matter of time. Why didn't anyone tell me Beth wanted to yell? But she didn't, because Beth seldom yelled. In fact, Beth didn't say very much at all. And since her grandmother died, she said even less. Oh, don't mind her. She's like that with everyone, her mother said to complete strangers, while Beth stood to one side wondering what she was supposed to do. Babble away about Annabie at all? It seemed so. Everyone admired her older sister, Jess, who chatted about the weather and traffic as if she were 45 and not 15. <laughs> Our neighbours are rich, Jess remarked, gazing at a gleaming Mercedes parked in the house opposite. We've done well to get it, Bill Boffin said, jangling the house keys. You mean you've done well, darling? Sylvie Botham kissed him slowly on the mouth. Beth glanced up the street to make sure no one was looking. She could put up with this type of behaviour at home. However, when her mother went misty-eyed and drooled, you're the most handsome man in the whole world, by the frozen peas in the local supermarket, Beth wanted to curl up and die. Sylvie Botham wasn't like other mothers. An actress in London's West End, 59 minutes out of every hour, she had her head stuck in a script for a play. The rest of the time, she spent shouting down the phone to her agent in London, telling him he was absolutely useless when a younger actress snaffled a role she'd had her eye on. Bill Boffin didn't roll his eyes when his wife still languished in her pyjamas at midday, put no food on the table in the evening, and left the washing basket piled so high it toppled over. He lived happily on sandwiches and bananas, and as he worked as a vet, 
and most of his clothes were splattered in fresh pig dung and cow slop daily, he saw little point in washing them. Taking the keys from his pocket, Bill unlocked the front door, allowing the family inside to explore. When Sylvie Boffin reached the small dark kitchen at the back of the house, she made the announcement, which unbeknownst to any of them, was to change number three Hawthorne Road from being a perfectly ordinary house to one that wasn't ordinary at all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.